Well, the Pittsburgh Penguins did it again. Points in eight straight, four straight wins. But here's the important thing. By beating the Tampa Bay Lightning 5-4 to four at PPG Paints Arena Saturday afternoon, the Penguins are now in a playoff position. Hi, I'm Dan Kingerski on the National Hockey Now and the Pittsburgh Hockey Now YouTube channel. Before I forget, like and subscribe somewhere right around there. You'll get all of these videos and updates uh, right from the locker room after the games. It's been a crazy time to cover the Penguins. I don't know how else to put it. I'm getting a little bit of credit for my prognostication that it wasn't over. Uh, credit to the boys at the fan. I walked past their booth at the Pirates home opener uh, on Friday, was it? I lose track of days. And Andrew Filipponi and Chris Muller like, there goes Dan Kingerski, the guy who thought, the only guy who thought the Penguins might do anything this season. I don't know uh, about that. I just... In my gut, I couldn't believe this team would go so quietly. Did I think they would be in a playoff position on April 6th? No, 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 I don't think that was possible to predict that the four teams, five teams they were battling would absolutely face plant into the mud, however they have. At the same time, the Penguins now have those points in eight straight, wins in six of those eight games. They did something I thought was quite impressive on Saturday. And, you know, the, the Twitter trolls were out because I tweeted uh, both Saturday morning and on Friday night, I didn't expect the Penguins to win on Saturday afternoon. Eight games in 14 days, nine games in 16 days. That takes an awful toll on your body, especially coming back from a four-game road trip. Traditionally, that's the letdown game. And I think Saturday had letdown written all over it. However, the Penguins were exceptional in the first period. I don't mean good. I mean they were exceptional in the first. If you notice, uh, against Washington... I thought they played back. They, they played structured. They created layers in the neutral zone, really kind of bottled up Washington on the breakout, and, and they enveloped them. Against Tampa Bay, they did something a little bit different. They aggressively forechecked. They got the puck deep in the zone. They were all over Tampa. You look at the wingers, uh, Michael Bunting, Drew O'Connor, Brian Rust, Sidney Crosby, even Evgeny Malkin, they, you know, they were heavy on the forecheck but uh as mike sullivan is often want to do when he faces john cooper tampa bay's coach who's been there 13 years sullivan always has a little wrinkle for john cooper and what they did on saturday was in addition to the heavy forecheck they sealed the wall at the blue line so tampa bay tried to just chip it off the wall get it out but the penguins were right there and even when uh, Tampa Bay put kind of an outpost forward near the blue line, the Penguins stepped in to disrupt that, not allowing Tampa Bay to come out of their zone with speed. They were especially effective in the first period, a little less so in the second period. But that was because uh, I think, obviously, teams are going to adjust and you can't keep that enormous pressure the Penguins had on Tampa Bay for 60 minutes. The Penguins played fierce in the corners, in fact, right behind me there. And on the walls, they were getting to the net. Uh, it didn't hurt that Vasilevsky let uh, a soft goal go in by Chris Letang that made it 3-1. to one. That was really, uh, I can't say the backbreaker because Tampa Bay storms back in the third period. But I think that was probably a, one of the difference-making moments of the game Saturday. If the, Tampa Bay was starting to push. They got within 2-1, to one and they had the momentum. Then Chris Letang's long-range shot trickles through Vasilevsky, rolls across the goal line. Penguins get three. Then Evgeny Malkin adds one. He and Michael Bunting just crash the net to get a couple of whacks at it. Does Malkin. Second one goes. Papa Malkin, tears to his eyes. The Penguins led 4-1, to one, and you're thinking, my God. They are actually on this kind of roll. And then, let's call it 15 minutes of hockey later, midway through the third period, teams are tied 4-4. Tampa Bay really turned up the heat. That was, that was the kind of desperation you see in a Game 7 of a series. 
it was wild. It was chaotic. There wasn't a whole lot of structure. It was just survival mode for both teams. They were scratching and clawing, and, and Tampa Bay is uh, really good. They've got some power plays. They know how to convert. If you can take one thing, or if the Penguins could take one thing from the game Saturday, it's that Tampa Bay has that same sort of umbrella setup as does the Penguins' power play. But you watch, almost like Space Invaders, for those of you old enough to have played it, they just keep marching. They keep collapsing the zone until the point on the power play is the top of the circles. And they're blasting away and they're grabbing every loose puck and they're just marching forward. The Penguins' PK uh, I thought was really good except for allowing Steve Stamkos to rip it from the dots. He gets a couple of goals and it's 4-4. And there we saw what the Penguins are made of. I don't know what changed. I don't know why this team today is different than the team a month ago, but it is. Rather than fold up the tent, rather than uh, shrug their shoulders and live to fight another day, the Penguins were the team that pushed back Michael Bunting at the net after Evgeny Malkin hit the post for a second time. Bunting uh, slams it into the net, 5-4 win. Okay, so now you're caught up. The Penguins are in the second wild card. If the Islanders and Flyers lose on Saturday, the Penguins are in third place. The playoff implications now start to become not if they make it, but who they would play. Second wild card probably plays the Rangers. Third place will play Carolina. <laughs> and this is, this is just craziness to me. But I, I will take a little bit of credit. I'm the one who kept telling you, relax, or not relax, but give it a bit longer. They still, uh, they still had a chance, even if that was a faint pulse. It was the other teams just never knocked them out as they should have. And they're going to pay for it, I do believe, as the Penguins. Uh, at this point, I don't see the Penguins missing the playoffs. Did, put out the, uh, the Twitter call for the Q&A, as we do uh, after every game now. And JC, one of my original followers back when I had 500 followers as Bud Moonshine on 93.7 The Fan, asked, what did I think of Eric Carlson's performance? I don't know that Mike Sullivan thinks Eric Carlson has hit his ceiling, but I will tell you a lot of the very good things Eric Carlson is doing. Carlson is getting the puck out of trouble by skating it out of trouble. He has McDavid-like ability. Maybe McDavid has Carlson-like ability since Carlson is, you know, what, six, seven years older. Just a little shimmy, a little turn of the feet here, a little wiggle there and the ability to generate speed on his edges. Carlson can get the puck out of trouble skating it uh, and push forward. Now all of a sudden, instead of pressure coming at you, now the Penguins are the team in transition. A month ago, I thought the Penguins' transition game generally stunk. Now it, it's, it's picking up. It's coming along. Carlson also is walking the blue line a little better nowadays, and he's getting shots through. That was the first goal that uh, Sidney Crosby deflected. So, <laughs> or was that Malkin that deflected the high shot from Carlson? Carl's, that was Malkin. Malkin's first goal was a Carlson deflection. So, uh, I, I like Eric Carlson's game. Perhaps there's more to love coming, but for right now, he is playing like, uh, he's adding those elements they desperately need. Cody asks, why does Mike Sullivan hate young players? Cody, sit right there. Tommy Boy will be back to hit you in the head with a tack hammer. What, what did Mike Sullivan do now? Was Oh, that's right. He, he didn't play Sam Poulin. Well, if you've watched the games, you know why. He dropped Valtteri Pustin into the fourth line. If you've watched the games, you know why. Drew O'Connor, P.O. Joseph have featured roles. Jack St. Ivany's getting good ice time. And St. Ivany, uh, especially in the first couple of periods, in the third period he was chasing a little bit because it was just wild chaos. But in the first couple of periods when the game was more structured, I don't know if you could see it on the TV, 
But St. Ivany was just bodying up anybody who wanted to come near Alex Nedeljkovic. I mean, he was fighting guys who were coming towards the crease. He didn't wait until they got there. He saw them coming and attacked them, pushing and shoving and fighting to keep them away from the cage. That allowed Nedeljkovic to make easier saves. That's the kind of thing when the other team starts to set up camp in the crease, these long-range shots become more difficult saves. When the crease is clear, these long-range shots are, are generally easy saves. It doesn't necessarily show up as a high-danger chance or a high-danger or a scoring chance when a guy's in the crease, but in reality it is. So St. Ivany doing the yeoman's work that he was doing um, uh, really, I thought, helped the Penguins. Joe wasn't asked, I, I think, a really difficult question to answer. We're going to dive into it anyway. Is the Michael Bunting trade, who is better for the Penguins, Michael Bunting, or was it Jake Gensel? I don't know how to answer that. It's, uh, I mean, obviously, you know how good Jake Gensel was, a 40-goal scorer, he kind of elevated Sidney Crosby's game. But as Crosby has elevated his own game in the pressure situation, perhaps Jake Gensel couldn't have done much more than what Sidney Crosby is already doing. By, by acquiring Michael Bunting, who is adding an element the Penguins were missing. I don't know where it came from. I, I know Mike Sullivan said it that little bit of a Hornquist element, right? Uh, I mean, Bunting is not Hornquist, but Quist, Quist, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Bunting is not quite to that level of insane net front agitator, but he does bring the fight. And the two goals that he and Malkin scored uh, later in the game were down low, below the goal line, scrapping, scratching, fighting, clawing for pucks, going to the net with them. So from that standpoint, the Penguins are a bit of a different team, and I think they're better for it. I'm not saying Jake Gensel didn't make the Penguins better. <laughs> I, I think that extra element on Evgeny Malkin's line certainly is changing the, the Penguins' temperament. It's changing how they play. It doesn't hurt that Drew O'Connor is all over the puck. He and Brian Rust on Crosby's wings are after that puck like it is oxygen. For everyone, uh, you know, some of the other questions too. I, I, know, I know the young players are getting so much love. Oh, it's the young players. That's why the Penguins are winning. Stop it. Stop trying to affirm older opinions. Look at who is doing this. Sidney Crosby. Here, I'll do it. Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, Chris Letang, Eric Carlson, Brian Rust. Uh, Ricard Raquel had a fantastic game on Saturday. The old guys are the ones who are picking everybody up and carrying them. It's not that the young players aren't contributing. Didn't say that either. But... I think some people are really trying way too hard to prove that Mike Sullivan hated young players or that their opinion that the Penguins needed to get younger, uh, they're trying too hard to prove that opinion correct. Chill out. Enjoy the victories. Don't sell Sidney Patrick Crosby short, even though he's 36. Uh, it really is the Penguins' vets who have all picked up their game to a playoff level. And that's why uh, I do think they're going to make the playoffs. Kind of insane. I know. Uh, a couple other questions that I, I don't really like. And, and multiple people asked uh, the question, if Ryan Graves is healthy, does he get back into the lineup? Now, what you want me to say is no. What you want me to say, you want me to downgrade Ryan Graves. And, and listen, Graves has had a rough season. He's had a really rough go with the Penguins. There, there's no two ways about it. I do think when Graves is ready to come back into the lineup, you'll see him on that third pairing, perhaps with a shorter rope, you know, maybe 
maybe if he doesn't pick up the slack or if he's shaky, you do see Ryan Shea popped um, back in the lineup quickly. I'm sorry. And it's not because Mike Sullivan hates Ryan Shea. It's that it's, it's almost pounding on the square peg to fit in the square hole. This should work. Then again, with five games to go and the Penguins winning, maybe Sullivan doesn't touch a thing. But I, listen, either way, if the Penguins can't win a game with Ryan Graves in the lineup, they've got uh, serious issues. But I, I know the question is not really in good faith. I, I know what you're really asking. And that's the same question I'm getting about uh, Alex Adelkovich and Tristan Jari. Will Tristan Jari play another game this season for the Penguins? And the answer is probably yes. In fact, I don't, or I wouldn't be surprised if he plays against Toronto. You don't want to wear Alex Nedeljkovic down. I think Nedeljkovic is your starter at this point. I do. So, having said that, do you want Nedeljkovic to have started 14 straight games? I don't know if he's done that in the last six years. I mean, genuinely, I, I don't know that he's had, had that kind of run. And you don't want to get to a situation where you're in the final couple of games and Tristan Jari is ice cold and Alex Nedeljkovic is worn to the nub. I don't know if I had that opinion a few days ago. Uh, I, I wonder if Nedeljkovic was a little bit tired on Saturday. Nine games, 16 days, right? Eight games, 14 days for Nedeljkovic. So... Uh, and I, you know, that Anthony Duclair goal was kind of the one that raised my eyebrow. Duclair from 30, 35 feet beats Nedeljkovic with a wrister. So a little fatigue, perhaps. I mean, you can't blame him. 50-50, Jari starts on Tuesday. Again, not the answer you want. You want me to just uh, elbow drop Tristan Jari? He's terrible. Wave him. They need to find somebody else. He's not. The, I, I know the, all the answers and all of the, uh, the tropes you want me to trot out right now, but remember you're talking to me, not a fan blogger or um, you know, uh, I, I don't want to downgrade fan bloggers or podcasters and all that, but we're, gonna, we're in different positions. Right, I'm trying to be as objective and straight-laced as I possibly can be. Emotion plays no role in, in what I'm bringing to you. So uh, from that standpoint, that's why I do think uh, Jari gets a game. I mean, let's, let's not kid ourselves. Jari was really good up until early March. I mean, he was fantastic this season. How many people kind of ate crow and were admitting, oh, I was against the Jari signing. In fact, one radio host who likes to talk to me about hockey a bit was like, oh, I, I see it now. Jari is pretty good. You know, a, a couple bad weeks and everybody's right off the bandwagon. You can jump on, jump off the bandwagon as much as you want. Uh, I think a little bit of, uh, you know, the rest will, will have helped Jari I would not expect to see him look shaky, terrible when he does get in here. And I think he has to get in uh, this week, th this, this coming week. Toronto, Nashville on the docket, Detroit. I forget who else. I know the Islanders are the last game of the season. I feel like I'm missing one. I'm sure you'll fill it in. Like, subscribe, comment. Let me have it. All right, I'm Dan Kingerski on the Pittsburgh Hockey Now and the National Hockey Now YouTube channel.